Hello and welcome to Artcast, a podcast from the Royal College of Art, home to the next generation of creatives, and the world's number one art and design university, representing the largest concentration of postgraduate artists and designers on the planet. We'll be bringing you insight into the philosophy behind the programs at the RCA by talking to staff, students, and the wider RCA community about what we do here and how the work of architects, artists, communicators, designers, and researchers affect the world at large. I'm Benji Jeffrey, and today I'll be talking to Martin Newth about how the arts and humanities can artfully highlight our own humanity. Martin is an artist working with photography, exploring the way it intersects with other kinds of practices and processes, such as filmmaking, sculpture and installation. He's the Assistant Dean in the School of Arts and Humanities here at the RCA, having previously been Programme Director for Fine Art at Chelsea College of Art and Design. Martin, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So... I'm going to start with a really big, broad question, (laughs) which is what is the distinction between arts and humanities and why are they so intrinsically tied? Well, I'm not quite sure about the distinction between the two, but arts and humanities is kind of like a catch-all term for um, the study of um, how the world operates. Um, so, So both through making, but also through a kind of an analysis. So I guess that's the distinction that arts kind of is about creating work and and solving, um, not necessarily solving problems, exploring problems, exploring challenges um, uh, through creation. And and humanities really looks at kind of analysing uh, how the world operates and how we how we are in the world and how we think and how we uh, make sense or not of uh, of the world around us. So at the RCA, we have a particular kind of suite of arts and humanities programmes, which gives us a a particular flavour to our particular approach to arts and humanities. And and so for us here, we have, interestingly, we have art courses, which are um, programmes which are, you know, very discipline focused. So like painting, sculpture and print. And we also have applied arts, um, which definitely see themselves as, as making art and thinking through making, but also kind of has that applied approach to uh, and, and relationship with craft. And then we have our suite of humanities courses, which are uh, like writing and curation and, and interestingly, history of design, which um, makes it a really kind of uh, rich array of kind of uh, programs that people study and things that people study here so that's a bit different from traditional universities where arts and humanities might also include you know things like sociology and history and english so we don't have those in quite that way but we definitely are interested in how we might uh, use the kind of study and research that goes on in those areas to inform the way that we make and think about art and design. Mm -hmm. And I guess in the same way that arts and humanities is kind of a a blurry header, kind of catch-all, people within those programmes and within those categories are are constantly pushing the distinction from within as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I think we're particularly interested here, and I'm particularly interested generally in, in how all the boundaries between things are being blurred, as you've just mentioned. And so the people are finding the edges of, of discipline, but also crossing over into disciplines and, and ways of ways of working. Um, that's a particularly appropriate now in the world. I think those things are kind of being, uh, lots of orthodoxies are being challenged. Lots of approaches to how you, how we think about the world are, are ripe for proper kind of interrogation and for a bit of unpicking and a bit of unravelling. And I think that's a really positive kind of force at the moment. So um, that's definitely something we're really interested in. But at the same time, we're also interested in what disciplinarity might mean for somebody. So, you know, you introduced me by saying, by mentioning a, you know, a, a craft, basically. You know, I'm interested in photography. So I do come from a particular discipline, even though, I, you know, when you say something like you are a photographer, people in their head think you might do weddings and stuff. I mean, that's not necessarily the case. Case, but um, I am very interested in how you have, uh, how you could argue that you can only really have interdisciplinarity or cross disciplinarity if you've also got disciplinarity. So we're interested in in the kind of that sort of paradox, I suppose, or that kind of contradiction and that messiness is exactly what some of the programmes that we're devising at the moment are trying to explore. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's in some way the importance of the distinctions is to be able to work against it. So we've got our um, making public moments for for the students coming up. Uh, And I guess within painting, for example, there would be people that aren't using any kind of paint, but thinking through what painting could be in a conceptual way. 
There are examples of that. I mean, you've, you've picked on an interesting examples because there are fewer examples of that than there were a few years ago, actually. Right. And that's, so these things ebb and flow and shift. So we have definitely, so if you go, for example, to printmaking, you definitely have people thinking in a very, very broad way about what the print might be mm. and about printed communication matter as, opposed, as, as well as kind of traditional uh, printmaking, craft-based activities. But there's a resurgence of some of these approaches and they, you know, since I've been engaged in art, these, these have ebbed and flowed. And so actually now if you go around the painting department, you, you, you see far more figurative paint, you know, pictures of people than, than, than I have done for many years, which is extremely interesting. And I think that's got something to do with a rise in interest in kind of positionality, in identity, and that's meaning that kind of that kind of form is really sort of um, yeah interesting to students at the moment. So, um, but we're also interested in the Royal College in those practices really being challenged by all the other kinds of practices and disciplines around it. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a positive challenge. That enables people to really have a kind of confidence in their own way of operating and a confidence in how it might fit into a broader array of what, what, what art might be. And what do you think that kind of broader sense is? Like, how do you feel like what's happening at the RCA fits into any kind of particular contemporary... Um I guess movements or, or moments that are happening. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's that's a really great question, and it's something I'm thinking about a lot at the moment. And I think the biggest difference between um, when I studied, frankly, and now is that when I studied, there was an idea of the art world, mm. and you would we were sort of desperate to lock into that and understand what that might be. That was that was the goal to think about what the art world and so we think about strategies to uh, enter this kind of uh, this this feeling that there was a kind of gatekeeping group who, who de decided whether or not you were allowed to be involved. That has definitely changed and the, the way it has changed is that now there are many art worlds and I think we uh, and that is a very exciting moment because it means that students can align themselves with all kinds of different ways of operating. And I think they have agency in a way they might not have done before, students might not have done before, in terms of creating kind of their own art worlds. It's also quite bewildering. You know, it's also quite unnerving somehow to think that there are all these different ways of operating. Of course, there are crossovers and there's still a fair share of kind of problematic gatekeeping for various, you know... Um, cliques for this one these cliques are very very big um but uh uh but i do think that's you know in terms of um, providing an education that's something we really have to uh think about and understand and unpick this idea of of being able to engage in this moment where there are lots of different ways of operating and lots of different possibilities mm, and it's so important to be aware of those different circles and worlds, right? Because there's a certain comfort in uh, establishing or being part of one, but then when they brush up against each other, sometimes it can be kind of terrifying. You know, if you're someone that's working in an experimental way and going to experimental events, and then suddenly you find yourself at, uh, oh, I tried to say this delicately, you know, kind of an old school uh, idea of what uh, a private view should be, for example, it can be quite jarring. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, th I think that's a really super important point. So uh, my feeling is you really kind of have to be articulate or, or aware of lots of different possibilities for operating. And I think the, the goal is really to be quite, be able to navigate different worlds, be able to move between them because you because you understand the context within which they operate. So um as you know, we're, we're developing, we're just about to launch this MFA in Arts and Humanities, which is specifically trying to interrogate all these different worlds, understand them, sort of go, get to the heart of how they might work so that students have confidence, even if it's not their art worlds, to understand you know, how they might align themselves with them or not. And I think... Um, all of us who, who make work, I mean, I know you, you, you're, you're a very good example of this, often move between different kind of groups and ways of operating in context. And uh, sometimes you want to subvert them and challenge them, and sometimes you want to work with them and within them. And I think it's, uh, yeah, it's a particularly kind of exciting moment for that. Yeah, it's kind of like a micro and macro kind of moving in and out of things. Yeah, yeah. And one thing I've, I've noticed at the RCA, particularly with, with students who are in like contemporary art practice, it feels like there's a lot of kind of event-based 
things happening now rather than kind of a, a move towards the uh, long form gallery exhibition as an example things kind of popping up and being events where, where works brush up against each other in a different way is that something you can kind of speak to yeah so it, it you've, you've, you've picked on probably my favorite subject now so <laughs> I, i'm really interested in the idea of what, what i've sort of the phrase i use called um events-based curriculum uh-huh. and i'm really interested in the idea that you might you know i've always been interested in learning through making i think mm-hmm. that's really important and that can you know that genuinely and engaging with materials but i'm also interested in learning through making things happen and actually that idea of the best way to really interrogate challenge yourself understand how you might work best is to is to do things and and to work out how you might uh, engage your work and activate your work um, with with audiences or with a public or publics and think about what that might be and not just think about what that might be but actually do things so yeah you're right on cap which is contemporary arts practice they have a you know a really events heavy curriculum and so they have things like a cap array which is a cap like well you, you get the pun <laughs> but the uh, where they will perform do kind of one minute performance sets and or films or readings and it's really very experimental and very fast moving and they did an amazing event at at Tate, at late at Tate um, last term, where they had all sorts of activities from kind of, um, you know, performance through to uh, kind of uh, inviting um, public to come and make things and make drawings and interact to kind of happenings to, yeah, all kinds of interesting activities. So that's definitely one way of operating, which I think is particularly useful for 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 kind of getting a really kind of intense and uh, exciting idea of kind of understanding how you might activate your practice. You did mention though slowness, well you touched on it, uh-huh. and so I'm also very interested in that because there's something about making sure that there's some space for a, a, a slightly s- slower pace of operating, and that's kind of tricky. In many ways, it's kind of tricky in the world at the moment, you might say, you know, this, this, this space for a kind of slower learning. And I'm really interested in being able to um, allow for students to operate at different paces and acknowledge that you learn and you understand and you make work at different paces. So, you know, um, whilst that cap situation, the, the contemporary art practice situation that I just described is very fast moving within that, I think there's still, you know, a real... Uh, a real kind of awareness and understanding and uh, embracing the fact that you might work kind of a little bit more slowly and generatively and there still be the possibility to do that. And MA is a great chance to do that. Yeah, and I guess it, it kind of, um, it foregrounds process w- within that and the idea that making public is a, a kind of comma rather than a full stop. You know, you're kind of working on an iteration of something rather than uh, some idea that there must be a final outcome. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, you know, if if education does anything, it focuses on process. Mm-hmm. I mean, what you just described is actually helping you. You know, we're you know, I'm not. I can speak for myself. I think gen- generally we're not as interested in the final products as we are in equipping people with the ability to understand the process by which they operate best. Mm. I think. In my very traditional education within art, I think I, you know, there, there was perhaps too much focus on the, the product. And I think the moment for me where I became uh, really aware of kind of a process of operating, both in terms of making work and in terms of how I wanted to uh, develop my, my, myself as a, as a practitioner, as an artist and researcher, happened after my education. So I think what I'm really interested in doing is providing that space for really understanding the process by which you operate with operate within the within the programs that we offer mm-hmm. and so in the world at large yeah there is a kind of uh, a sense of speed right <laughs> there's uh, there's certain journeys and paths that we should that we maybe feel like we should be on and it's difficult to to move uh, out of that so i'm talking quite an abstract term but i suppose you know you kind of think b a m a PhD, got to get in those galleries, got to get in the new contemporaries, got to get in the kind of like under 30s category for, for things, which is really difficult to to kind of work against. Do you have any kind of strategies for thinking through working against those kind of uh, strict ideologies? Yeah, I mean, that it's really interesting that you say that's now uh, in the world. In a way, I feel, you know, I, 
I graduated in the 1990s. I think it was a bit worse then. Oh, really? I think the, there was an idea of a young artist. There was a, like a, an absolute obsession with the, the notion of a young artist. There were mm. people, you know, in, in I remember in the British Art Show, there was an artist who was 19, you know. Wow. And, I mean, this this was the sort of thing that happened. I mean, I think there was a real, you know, and, and with, the, with the YBAs, I mean, it's written into the thing, young British artists, it was about youth. There was a kind of obsession. Mm. Um, with that sort of moment, I don't think that's quite the same now. Mm. I think there's there is definitely an understanding that you can be a kind of developing mid career artist well into you know l- later in life, and I think that's that's kind of positive. I, I think I've also always been really interested in um, making well the, the the work I'm interested in is kind of serious, you know, and I don't mean serious in a dull way that's kind of you know you know super sort of browbeating but has a kind of rigor to it you know i'm interested in in stuff which is you know seems like it's not just a a one-liner or a joke you know and Mm -hmm. i do think there's more of that kind of practice being being developed and and yeah and as i said a sense of of artists being acknowledged a little bit later on in their career so i you know I, i don't think there's quite quite that in the same way there was the other thing, though, you're touching on, which is a slightly, if I can twist your question a little bit, uh-huh. is, yes, we are in a world now where there are real urgencies. And so there is a sense of urgency about how we need to operate. We, you know, we kind of need to, you know, not necessarily, well, we do need to find answers as a, as a species, don't we? You know, we really need to, you know, there are terrible things happening and we, you know, there's an awful responsibility on younger generations to sort, sort of deal with this, the problem. There is, though, space for that to happen in a way that isn't absolutely knee-jerk. It, mm-hmm. it, there is definitely, I mean, maybe one of art and humanities' uh, roles here is to provide some perspective and distance and a kind of different kind of interrogation of these problems than literally just trying to find problem-solving mm. uh, well, solutions. I guess it's about distinguishing where the urgency sits. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> because yeah. if within a practice you, you feel like the urgency sits in you having to simply make things for the sake of making, then it's it's a problem. But it's about finding where the urgencies are and working with them. Yeah, 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 yeah. And one, you know, one of the ways of dealing with an urgency of, of, of now is that thing I was talking about is kind of a slowness. I mean, perhaps mm. we do need to return to slightly a different pace of engagement with each other and with mm. the world, you know, yeah. and actually art can do that fantastically well and craft can, you know, there's all sorts of examples, you know, if we look at, you know, different kind of ways of thinking indigenous cultures and the way they kind of uh, make and, and interact, you know, maybe there's a lot to be learned from some of those sorts of approaches at, at this moment. And I think, you know, arts and humanities are particularly good at interrogating how that might help us. Mm. And then kind of picking up on the, the idea of... Um I suppose, uh, art doing things uh, and being serious, not necessarily dull, but being serious. How then does that kind of, I mean, this is a, a big question, you know, there was kind of art for art's sake and then a kind of Marxist socialist opposite to that, which is that work should be politicised. How does work that isn't politicised sit within this conversation? Or is it even possible to make work that isn't politicised? That is a huge question, um, and <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to come up with the, the exact answer to that now. I mean, I I think I think it would be odd not to to be making work and deny it has a political dy- dynamic to it in mm-hmm. sort of in whatever you're doing. That would be a weird position to take from my point of view. Yeah, that doesn't mean to say work has to have a sort of aboutness in it mm-hmm. all the time. You know, it doesn't have to be. I, I suppose. Uh, you know, from what you're suggesting, the, the concern implied in the conversation is that artwork in its worst manifestation always just becomes illustrative of a problem or mm-hmm. kind of um, instrumental in terms of how it operates in the world. I think there's definitely a space for work to do things which we don't quite understand or are able to articulate. Um, but I do think there, as I said, there's a sort of political dynamic to that. And I think part of being a, a student now and being at a, a college, which is really, you know, you know, prides itself on its research, is understanding how work might do that, even when it's not overtly political. Mm-hmm. And I guess it's about context, right? It's, it's, I guess it's kind of white, uh, thinking of the, the opposite of that, it's kind of the white cube mentality that, you know, the, the white wall of the gallery can make you forget all your worries and everything that exists outside of it. Like we're always going to be brushing up against some kind of context. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, um, 
And I think we are becoming more and more aware of that. You know? mm-hmm. And I think uh, you're, you're right. Nothing's ever made context-free, is it? You know? Yeah. Uh, the white cube comes with its own huge amount of baggage and it is such a powerful context in itself. It's weird not to, you know, at least at least nod to it if you're making work or acknowledge, acknowledge that that's, that's a powerful context just as much as political situation at the moment might be. Yeah, and also kind of a political ideology doesn't have to be something that is necessarily heavy all the time you know the bell hooks talks about joy as a political act you know there's kind of yeah, ways yeah. of working with the political that isn't always uh sitting heavy on top of you i guess yeah uh, uh, beautifully put i mean absolutely you know and um yeah i, I suppose tying this in with your conversation about what we do at, at, at on courses and, and for ma students is really understanding that or, or interrogating that sharing how we might be doing that you know and sometimes it, it you know, there's a, there's moments of self-realization that this thing you were doing, which sort of felt right, and that that seemed like it was worthwhile, you start to be able to understand and articulate with the help of others and with your peers, and it's something you know we're all probably still doing. Is actually working out actually why it's 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 worthwhile and what gives it its traction in the world. Yeah. What's the point? And does it need a point? Yeah. And if it doesn't exactly. have a point, does it matter? <laughs> so other, we've got the, like we said before, we've got the kind of making public moment coming up for students. Is there anything happening on the the programmes that you think is particularly kind of exciting within the context of this conversation? I mean, there's there's too many things that are really exciting <laughs> within the context of this, uh, this conversation to mention. But I think what, what you will get is a, an amazing moment to see this vast array of positions, of practices, of approaches it's really surprising Mm -hmm. that's that's what i would say and having been involved in a kind of few assessments recently the range of ways people are operating is is genuinely challenging for me it's genuinely you know for 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 a viewer for anybody coming to see you have work all the way from people working in kind of um auto theory and thinking about their own uh, family archives and how they make sense of those all the way through to people working with kind of AI and wondering what that means for us at the moment and how we're going to how we're going to navigate this strange world of kind of post truth and the rest of it. So um, yeah, you'll see all sorts of ways of operating. Something I'm, I'm really interested in is the fact that we we're starting to see more and more students work together, either collaboratively mm. or collectively. I feel there's a there's more space for that to be developed here at Royal College, and some of the things we're we're trying to work with on this this new program we're working is really finding ways of making that possible. Because, um, you know, a lot of the things that we're talking about are really emphasising what you get from being involved in a community. Mm. Um, you know, working these things, these problems through with others, working alongside each other, and I think. In the world, I mean, this is your first question you asked about what's happening at the moment in the world. There are interesting examples of more collaborative and collective practice, which you, you really do are operating against the tide of individualism mm. in the world. And I think, you know, on the programmes, I think there's even more space for that. So I'm particularly interested in where those are, are developing at the mm. moment. I'm just trying to think, Was do you feel that like that's something that has come together kind of post the the height of the pandemic or because when was the the Turner Prize had uh, an all collective shortlist didn't it was that pre or post pan I think that was mid lockdowns. wasn't it was mid it? lockdowns yeah because yeah. that felt like a real kind of pinpoint in terms of an acknowledgement of, of this collective working being something that is 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 more kind of prevalent than it was before yeah I mean I I, I think that's right I think um, yeah I mean I, I think that this has been developing at, at art colleges for quite a while mm. and and particularly you know for all sorts of really amazing really interesting reasons students have been working together understanding the networks they build whilst they're on courses can be really great networks to develop um once they leave um and i think the turn price sort of caught up with that a little bit actually you know i mm. think that's been going on for a while you know at the same time one of the things lockdowns did though is they sort of um they might have uh, they might have made us realize how important our communities were but it also drove some drove us literally to our individual spaces so mm. um you know and you know it's one of the challenges of a university of of any kind of a uh, place which assesses students Therefore, that's sort of the suggestion there that that's about assessing an individual and what an individual has learned. So, you know, we might not in our structures help actually develop 
you know, collaborative and collective pr practice. So I'm really interested in, in finding ways to work work around those kind of processes, which which can often be correctly described as being a little bit individual. Uh -huh. You know, so um, I, I think that's a yeah, as I said, that's a particularly interesting space for us at the moment. Yeah, and within these these collective works, there's a sense of um, finding knowledge in in alternative ways. And, and you mentioned before about works from the show that were that were about uh, family memories and AI, and obviously ChatGPT is a big thing at the moment. How do you feel like contemporary making arts and humanities is responding to these new forms of knowledge, and and also this kind of questioning of the knowledge that we we see as the canon. So that's like an absolutely enormous question. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll have to do that in two parts, I think. Let's get to the canon things in a minute. That's brilliant. That's a great question. But I suppose what art and humanities have always done amazingly well is to be able to take technologies that exist and to kind of break them a little bit or, or use them in the wrong way slightly mm. and therefore find out how they can be used. So this may be too long an anecdote for a podcast, but I'll tell you anyway, there's a, there's a fantastic thing about the first Sony video camera that Sony made before, um, and they made it because they had the technology to do it, the, the Handycam, but they didn't really know what it was for. So their early adverts would show people kind of sitting around a pool, kind of doing like family plays, as though that would be the use of it. That turned out not to be the use of it at all. And what happened is that very quickly, uh, feminist uh, filmmakers and uh, kind of performance filmmakers started using the, the camera and so did uh, groups like the Black Panthers and various other kind of activist groups because it was a way of, you, of filmmaking which wasn't tied into a kind of craft that was actually pretty much you know the 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 mastery literally of of a bunch of men basically so mm -hmm. it got completely reimagined and taken by artists and activists and worked out how it might be deployed in the world mm. that's a really good example i think of well, if you transpose that now to AI, I think people are working a similar way. They're working, how can we slightly unpick this, use this in a different way, kind of think mm. a bit differently how it might describe and help us understand our humanity as we're talking about today, you know, and uh, rather than kind of um, just plug in into chat B GBT to get it to write an essay, which is the least in interesting thing that it's going to do, I think. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, yeah, I guess it comes back to as well, like idiosyncratic ways of, of, of working with things. So for example, people who are, are working with paint might be thinking about their own way of working with paint rather than the correct way of working with paint, which I guess it d differs from a kind of art, art historical way of, uh, of yeah. education being of the, the, the great master who teaches their craft. Yeah, that's that exactly. So this is the perfect um, example of this idea of challenging the canon, which mm -hmm. is absolutely right. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, at the Royal College, we still we do have disciplined courses, you know, and there is a suggestion there that, you know, learning a uh, high level to do painting or printmaking does suggest a little bit of that following the the, the, the master, you know, kind mm. of ways of doing it. But actually, you know, from my point of view, what I want students to become is experts in their own work yeah. as opposed to experts in anybody else's you know that's the point and so it could be that you're an expert in manipulating blue tack or you know whatever it might be but yeah you're absolutely right it's about finding um you're finding the confidence and the, and having that sense of um experimentation to to be able to you know use use anything in in the way that you think is appropriate mm, and i think i mean you might have a different way of thinking about this i always think that an MA in particular is the space for finding that confidence to be an expert because I suppose on your BA you're figuring stuff out right and then I mean it's not an exact science but on your BA you're figuring things out and then on your MA you're like right I'm coming here to become the expert in this one very particular blue tack way of working. Yeah I mean that that's right I, I think that's a nice way of putting it I, I think though you know you could suggest there's a, the opposite of that as well right. actually you know which is um you know it can be a moment to really you know really uh blow things apart a little bit and actually mm -hmm. the confidence is actually in not knowing every day yeah so not really being an expert you know you can you can almost do the opposite so i'm sort of disagreeing with myself slightly but <laughs> I, I you know i do see that as a very interesting uh very interesting area i mean um last week i went to a presented at a conference in glasgow called on not knowing how artists teach and that idea of not knowing being something that actually you can you, you can run with as a sort of strategy and approach actually that sort of sense of, of yeah of, of not being an expert is something mm. also extremely interesting and in a way that requires more confidence perhaps yeah. than than mastery and how does that kind of fit into the phd work that's happening here because i guess that is 
well, I guess this is, again, is a twofold question. How does research fit into this kind of thought on alternative forms of knowledge? And uh, how does a sense of mastery, I guess, come through in a PhD or in a sense of experiment experimenting towards becoming a master? Okay. So- <laughs> So the way I'll answer that is by picking on that word experimentation, because mm-hmm. I think an art school context is such an interesting word, and I think it's so often used in the wrong way. Right. And I've probably already done it myself in in this conversation. But there's a, there's a, an idea that experimentation at an art school means that you're going to do something like chuck a TV out the window, and that's experimentation. That's not experimentation. That's we know what's going to happen. It's going to smash yeah. on the floor. That's, that's not you know that is sort of a, a be- behaving in a way that we uh, imagine might be experimentation experimental. For me, experimentation has rigor involved in it. So if you think about it in a scientific context, you test something out. If you if it doesn't fully work, you you adjust something minutely and you test it out again and you do it again. And there's a, there's a sort of rigor. You still don't know exactly what you're you're getting. You, you know you have a goal in mind, but you're you're constantly finding out. I think applying that idea to to a PhD is exactly how it operates in its best way is that mm. it's, it has this this layer of experimentation in that no one's quite explored this area but it does it with real rigor and it's about kind of a testing and adjusting no but i think it comes back again to this kind of idea of, of, of speed and slowness because i guess the reason sometimes people don't uh, engage meaningfully with experimentation is uh, a fear of failure uh because perhaps there's a sense that you need to get to a certain point by a certain time which is paradoxically not going to be very useful yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I couldn't agree more with that. I don't, I don't know what the I don't know what the answer is really, but um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, f- there is there is a fear of failure. We all have it, of course. But um, you know, we're trying to create a space where we don't really talk about failure because. Mm something not working is miles away from a failure because yeah. you've learned loads in working out how it's not going to, it didn't quite work. So, yeah. um, yes, yeah, it's, it's a very, odd, you know, it's, it's a very odd thing. I mean, at, at the Royal College, we have, we, we don't give people grades in mm. assessment, for example. So we could talk about it being pass fail. Mm. I mean, in a way it's, you know, that's not that helpful either. It's kind of pass pass, yeah. you know, but you know, because, um, yeah, I, I, you know, I think failure is perhaps, I perhaps try and avoid using that as a term. I think I always think that failure is something that we should, we need to kind of reconsider as something that sits next to success yeah, rather yeah. than op- the opposite of success, because it's, yeah, it's such a useful, maybe a not a useful term, yeah. but a useful thing to be able to to be willing to do. Yeah, I mean, you know, and and I think. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, lots of people completely engage with it in a side-to-side way that you've just described, you know, understanding that they, that, you know, the, the thing that they're set out to do won't succeed. And that, you know, that's sort of a success in itself, you know, because it's opened up an, another set of ways of approaching. So um, ways of working. So, yeah. Great. Uh, Going to start wrapping up now, but I just wondered if you had any advice for people who want to engage with arts and humanities as kind of contemporary topics, whether there's any particular artists you think people should be looking at or any texts or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, again, that kind of ties in with what we talked about earlier, which was, you know, 20 years ago, I think I would have given you a, a, a list, uh-huh. would, you know, and I would think this, this is my way of doing things. So it's it's a really interesting question because, you know, in our unit specifications that we write for various units, we we write, we, we have to write a reading list uh-huh. and, and we have kind of essential texts and recommended texts. That's the format. I'm interested in slightly breaking that because why would you want to read what I've read? Yeah. You know, you, I'm, you know, at MA level, I'm interested in knowing what you, if I'm taught, as a student, what you bring, you know, mm. particularly with this MFA that we're developing, we're really interested in this idea of partnership mm. and co-authorship of an experience and the students bringing their histories, knowledges, cultures, approaches, previous educational experience and bringing that to interrogate that and share that. So um, that that's... One thing, specifically on this list that we provide students now, we are also interested in slightly mixing that up. So now we have suggested texts, things that you should listen to, things that you might watch and places that you might visit. And again, that is a slight challenge of a canon in itself by acknowledging that all sorts of different people work, um, learn in all sorts of different ways. And I mm. think that's really important to acknowledge. So my advice is to, uh, to, to not seek out one thing, to try and see as much as possible and get a broader kind of array of influences, you know, as, as you possibly can. Um, you know, having said that, even places where I'm very familiar of going to, 
you know, as I said, like 20 years ago, I would have said, I'll oh, definitely look at Art Monthly every month. It's mm-hmm. fantastic. Actually, if you do look at Art Monthly now, you will see it has also really broadened its scope of what it's mm-hmm. writing about, what's interrogating. So, you know, the, the whole world's doing this and that's super exciting. Um, uh, but yeah, so that's so build your own canon, basically. Build your own canon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you're an, if you're obsessed with Love Island and want to interrogate it as a kind of contemporary example of socialising, then like be confident to do so. Yeah, and what you will find is loads of people writing about it and interrogating it at a very serious level. You yeah, know? and that's a big shift because you know. But then I guess that's the question: is where do you find that? If you are someone that's doing that kind of thing, where do you? How do you find that? Sorry, this is probably a big question. I want to know as well. So. <laughs> I, well I, I personally, I never feel it's very far away. I mean, I, right. th- I think, I think, uh, you know, a Google search, failing that, go to the library and ask yeah. because yeah, they're, yeah, yeah. they're kind of absolute experts in finding that knowledge. You yeah. know, but e- even if you go to, um, you know, even if you do a Google Scholar search, I mean, mm-hmm. if you tap in Love Island, you will come up with pages. Yeah, of, yeah, you yeah. Know, and actually, that, that that's interesting because in my opinion, approach that I've just described about everyone finding their own way you know that there is a problem there because there's so much it's impossible to navigate so Mm. one of the things a program or a course does it is really help you identify those sources which are going to be more useful and more helpful for you so Mm. um uh yeah I think I think you get you you know in whatever you're you're trying to get I'm trying to think about who would be writing about Love Island and that's not (laughs) that's not going to help us in this conversation (laughs) but it's more about um yeah I I think you get more clearer about how you can identify those voices which are more useful than others I suppose yeah cool all right well thank you Martin uh, you've been listening to Arcast, the Royal College of Art podcast, home to the next generation of artists, innovators and entrepreneurs and the world's number one art and design university. You can learn more about our programmes at rca.ac.uk, as well as finding news and events relating to the college and our application portal if you're a prospective student. <laughs> <laughs>